Welcome to A Voice for Creators. I'm your host, Daniel Norton. In this podcast, I'm going to talk a little bit about the two types of photographers or creators. Or rather, yeah, there's two types of photographers or creators. Those who say there's two types of things and those who don't, <laughs> like me. So I, the reason why I bring this up is because I think it's really interesting. I feel like a lot of times we as creators believe there is a very specific path or maybe two or maybe three that gets you to where you need to go. But the truth of the matter, spoiler, <laughs> is that there's not. Everybody has their own path and you definitely can look at what other people have done and use that as a navigation tool, let's say, to get you going or to get past certain hurdles. But in the end, your journey is your own. And that's what we need to realize as creators if we actually want to move forward. So as I say, I'm in the second camp. I don't believe there is just two types of people for really anything, I think. But I do think that there are different ways to approach things in a more general fashion, which is really what that kind of saying means, right? And then we get more specific. So let, let's talk about it a little bit in both areas. And I'll talk about a little of my story. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. Just so you know, I'm changing up my email here. If you want to send me an email, send it to a voice at dnphoto.com. This will make it a little easier for me to get to them. I don't have to go to a different email address. A voice at dnphoto.com will drop them into my regular email. Because if you don't know, my photo site is dnphoto.com. First of all, I want to talk about the idea of some kind of generalistic paths, right? There are paths, right? If I'm going to make a podcast like this one or YouTube videos and other people do this as well, we are giving you general roadmaps, kind of the big picture. Well, if I want to get into a more retail type photography, so I want to, that is to sell to directly to the public, then I want to make sure I advertise in these certain places. If I want to get into more commercial type photography, that is my client, it's businesses, I want to approach it maybe with direct mailers or using uh, appoint, getting appointments with advertising agencies and, and those kind of things, right? So those big swaths of ideas or techniques or advice are useful, right? But we also want to get deeper than that, which we will in a second. But let's talk about some of the major stuff. I would love to hear from you about the types of creators you are. I know that there's not just photographers listening to this because I get emails from you and tweets and everything else. I would love to know what other types of creators we have here. I think that so much of this applies to all of the arts, and it's great to hear from other perspectives, even though my background, of course, is primarily photography. And as such, I'm going to break down photography as three kind of paths. There are lots of other things. Let me know if, if there's something else you think would be a major path, but I consider these the major ones. And we're talking about trying to make money in photography here. You've got your, what I called earlier, retail photographers, the ones that sell directly to public. That would be like wedding photographers, portrait photographers that sell, again, directly to the public, like a portrait studio, like for school photos or engagement photos, stuff like that. People that do the photos for little league teams or other sports teams, soccer teams, stuff like that. That's a retail photographer. You are selling directly to the person that wants the photos, and oftentimes they are also the subject of the photo. The commercial photographer, on the other hand, is selling or creating photos for a client to serve a certain purpose, oftentimes advertising. It could also be catalog. It could be display. Effectively, what you're doing is you're photographing a product or, or people, oftentimes models, but it could be almost anything, for use in some kind of commercial endeavor. So let's say I have a store that sells knit caps. I might hire a photographer to photograph the knit caps either as still lifes or possibly on mannequin heads, or I might have them photograph them on a model. That model could be from an agency. It could be a friend of mine. It could be somebody the photographer brings. It could be me, but it's different than a portrait photographer in the sense that even if the owner of the hat shop uses themselves as the model, it's not the same kind of thing as a retail photographer, right? It's a different type of business. And then finally, you've got what we'll call art photographers. These are the photographers that produce photos uh, for just to be looked at in an artistic way. Could be somebody who sells books of art. Could be somebody who shows in galleries and sells it. Could also be, this would overlap into also something like the person that produces photos that might be hung on the wall of hotels. I guess that falls under stock photography as well. So these are like three prongs, right? So if I was to say, well, there's three types of commercial photographers or three types of businessy photographers, you know, you could use that. 
But any of these could be broken up into separate areas. If I may, I've already mentioned some of them. If I'm a retail photographer, I might be a wedding photographer. I might be a sports photographer, a school photographer. I might be a baby photographer. There's all different things I could be selling directly to the clients. I could be somebody that works in a nightclub and makes photos of people that are enjoying the nightclub and gives them a print or on the street. We have those in New York City a lot where they make a print for you right away. Those would be retail photographers, all different paths. How do I get into any of them? It's not exactly the same, right? Everybody's got their own story, their own path. Same for commercial stuff. You might be a food photographer. You might be somebody who shoots annual reports. So you mix portraits and architecture. You might be an architectural photographer. There's all different ways to break it in. So there's not two types of photographers ever, right? You could say there's two types of photographers, ones that do it for the love of it, ones that do it for work, but shouldn't we be both, some of us, <laughs> right? So again, I don't think this this divide works. And I, I, I use it as an example only because I think it's really interesting. I was thinking about the other day, well, part of this comes down to, I've decided after many, many people have been asking me to do this for so long, that I'm going to start offering mentorships again. Before I actually started doing YouTube and uh, these kind of things where a lot of you probably know me from, when I was working as a, just a commercial photographer, a fashion photographer, oftentimes I would mentor people. They would come to me and they would become an apprentice, if you will, not a photo assistant that I'm paying, but somebody who pays me effectively to help them grow their business. And this was a business I did a little bit here and there when somebody would ask me. I never really solicited it. But now, since I kind of do this for everybody in a loose way, it made me realize that, you know, here I am giving out this more generic advice or general advice that's good for everybody. But there are people out there, again, they're reaching out to me that want specific advice. So if you're one of those people, let me know. You can send me an email and uh, we can see if we can work on something. I'm working on individual mentorships. I'm going to work on local workshops. So if you're in New York City or the area and also uh, some online course type stuff. So these are things I'm going to start adding into the repertoire. So look forward to that. Um, if you don't follow me on the other platforms, you, you should. All that stuff is in the description below so you can follow me and when these things happen if you're interested in them you can certainly join up anyways long story short when i first started as a photographer of course i started as a photo assistant you know i, I came into this thinking i was going to go to modeling agencies and they were going to pay me to shoot the models because of course i thought hey my work is really good turns out it wasn't really as good as i thought <laughs> in a commercial sense and I then decided to work as a photo assistant. I was kind of going to do that anyways, but I thought that'd be a side thing. Being a photo assistant became my main job for several years. And I worked for a lot of different types of photographers. And when I started shooting on my own, there were a handful of photographers, probably five or six, that I worked for a lot up to that point. Some of them I didn't really work for anymore, even before I went shooting myself. But there were people who became my friends. They were kind of mentors in a different way, right? Because I worked for them and I learned from them. And I remember each one I went to go visit and I asked them, what were your steps? How did you break out from whatever you were doing before, whether you were a photo assistant or you had some kind of a job? How did you become a professional photographer? And everybody told me their story. I mean, why wouldn't they? A good, secure, professional photographer isn't worried their assistant's going to steal all their clients. If you're worried about that, then either your assistants are really, really good <laughs> or or you feel like you're not, right? But anyways, that, that's a whole side thing. That's a confidence thing. If you'd like me to do a whole episode on confidence, let, let me know. That could actually be an interesting topic. But anyways, I'm kind of going off on the side like I always do. Basically, when I started to assess their stories, I realized that everybody did it a different way. Like sometimes dramatically different. And when I found that out, I was actually kind of distraught because I was hoping, of course, <laughs> that I think like many of us do, that there was a path that I would go to all the photographers and they would say, oh yeah, well, what I did was I did this, this, and this, and then my work started coming in. Then I did this, this, and this to grow it. And now here I am today. It wasn't like that. It was very, very different. And it made me think, well, if there's no path to do it, how do I know which way to go? I'm standing in the middle of a desert and I've lost all sense of direction. I don't know where anything is. Where do I go? But as I started to really actually try to go out there and do work on my own and take some of the tips that people uh, had given me and some of the ways they went, try to incorporate some of it, what I found was I could carve my own path. As I started to walk in the direction and then eventually run, I found that I was blazing my own trail. And I think that we all 
blaze our own trail. That's what's important. Those who follow the exact process of somebody else will never really get to the point of being fully fulfilled, in my opinion, as the photographer or creator, whatever. If I take a course on, hey, how do what are the step-by-step processes of learning how to take headshots for actors in New York? And of course, I'm thinking about this because we just did a mentoring, mentoring, Marissa. If you watch my YouTube channel, you'll see that coming up. Um, and she wanted to learn how to do headshots. And I could show her, right? I could show you, you. If you came to my studio right now, I could show you in a day pretty much everything you would need to know to photograph different types of people, different headshots, and make them good. I could teach you that in one day. But if you came to me and said, Daniel, I want to grow my business. I want to expand. I want to go professional. It would probably take multiple sessions over time for us to work together to figure out what your path is. Because the reality is knowing how to light the headshots is only a small fraction of the business. There's so much more to it. And how you approach it is going to be unique to you. Having somebody help you or just doing it on your own by trial and error is the only way that you can find it. And it's going to require self-awareness. What you've got to be able to do is look at what you're doing and figure out if you are moving in a path that seems correct. And sometimes you'll think you are and you're not. And you've got to be willing to, we'll say cut the losses is a pretty common term, and step away if you're not. If you're going down this path and you've been running these ads in this actor magazine and now you're invested a bunch of money because people told you you should be doing that and you're not getting any headshots from that, but you've been putting flyers up around town and that's getting you headshots, and but that's only cost you $20, you might have this doubt like, well, no, no, everybody else used ads and that worked really well for them. I, I'll keep doing the flyers, but I got to keep doing the ads. That will eventually work for me. It might not. It might never work for you, even if it worked for other people. If something is working for you, you need to double down on it. Don't just do what people tell you is the right thing. You've got to experiment. You've got to try. Ideally, you want to build a core group of mentors and peers that can help you along your path, that can actually look at you and say, you need to stop doing that. You should do this because they're looking from the outside. They don't have that emotional attachment to it. Ultimately, your path, the path that you take is going to be your own. You know, there's two types of photographers out there. The ones who think there's just one path to take and the ones that go their own way. Guess which one's the most successful? That's what I'd like to know. You can leave me a message uh, using the Anchor app. The link is in the show notes. Or you can send me an email. Like I said, my new email now is avoice at dnphoto.com. That's also in the show notes. You can attach a message to it, a voice message. I can play it on the air if you want to have your voice on the air. Or you can just send me an email. And speaking of an email... I've got a great one. Okay, this one here is from Matthew. Daniel, thanks so much for the podcast and YouTube channel. I have learned an incredible amount from you. The past few weeks of the podcast have been extremely interesting, following a very organic line of thinking. So much so I've been delaying my question because each episode you answer more of my questions. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) You have talked about lots of trends, developing style, and the kind of navigating the noise. On your YouTube channel, you really reinforce this idea that solid technique uh, leads to style by allowing all of us to witness your process. Thank you. My question is, what kind of stuff should we who are into fashion photography be looking at, and what should we not be looking at to help find a style? Uh, As a classically trained musician, one of the biggest ways we develop our sound, especially in the formative years, is to listen to as many great recordings and live concerts as possible. Is there an equivalent to photography? How do we navigate the noise and develop a good foundation? Thanks so much, Matthew. Okay, well, this is a great question that I kind of read in a messy way. Sorry, Matthew. (laughs) Um, So... This is good. I'm going to break it down kind of generally and then also fashion, but I'll do fashion first because I think that's actually really interesting. So I've said before, if you didn't hear that in the podcast or see me other places, when I was primarily doing fashion and even now, I rarely looked at photos, especially not fashion photos. And what I mean by looking at fashion photos, I mean like recent ones, like I didn't look at Vogue, right? My reasoning for this then 
and now is that being a fashion photographer is about being ahead of the trends. Not necessarily a trend setter, but recognizing the trends ahead of time and being there as they're being developed so that when they finally hit mass market, you've already got that in your book. You're the one bringing it to the market. That is the goal. Now, once you're more established, like many things in life, it's actually easier, right? Because when you're in with brands, they come to you six months, a year in advance with the new designs to shoot, right? But when you are developing your portfolio, trying to get yourself established to show people that you can be ahead of the trends, part of it is going to be the clothing, right? Part of it is going to be getting in the loop with stylists, both makeup and fashion stylists, that seem to have a real connection to what's going on. That is to say, if I was looking at a stylist to work with and they were like, oh, I saw in Vogue this month, although they'll probably say something like in Portuguese Vogue, or it's always some other country's Vogue, uh, you know, here in the US, that pink shirts are in, pink shirt editorial. I would probably look at that and go, too late. <laughs> you know, I mean, I might not. I might want to shoot with them because I like them, whatever. But if they're getting their ideas by looking at magazines or Instagrams of fashion bloggers, people that are basically talking about what's already in fashion, because again, once it's in the magazine, it's already in fashion, it's too late. Instead, if I had a fashion stylist who was like, yeah, I took a trip down to, you know, the east side and went to a bunch of clubs over the weekend. And I noticed that a lot of the the people were wearing these like gold lame headbands. And I'd never seen anybody do that before, but it was really interesting. And I noticed like at least three or four different groups of people where somebody had a gold lame headband. We should probably do something with that. That's the stylist you want to work with. They are the ones that are looking for things that aren't necessarily popular, but that they see going on. They see these trends growing. And the stylist is your friend. And to be a fashion photographer or stylist is a lifestyle. Unlike so many other types of photography, you might be a car photographer and love to drive fast cars, but you might not really care about cars. You might just love the challenge of photographing them. But to be a fashion photographer, you are fully engulfed in the system, in the system of fashion becoming popular, in the, the trends in the world of it. This is really important. And again, when you're young, you do that by going to clubs and by interacting with people that are kind of, we'll call them the artsy people, whatever you want to call it, because those are generally where this stuff comes from. One thing that I featured when I was in Miami and I got into one of the local magazines was a feature that we did every week of a young, unknown fashion designer. I was seeking out these, these people that were fresh out of school or never went to school and they were just hitting the streets of, of Miami Beach in Miami, trying to get their designs in different places, unknown. And while a great designer will draw people to your magazine, so you always want to put that on the cover a lot of times, right? Having these unknowns in there was cool because if they blew up, then you were the one that was there when they blew up, right? And this is kind of what we're trying to do as a fashion photographer. So my advice would be live the fashion if that's what you really want to do. Be in on the creation meet up with people that are that love it find designers fresh if you don't know anybody and you're not in that kind of crowd find a school that teaches fashion design and try to interact with some of those students you know say hey i'm a photographer and i'm looking for cool designs i'll shoot your stuff and maybe some of them will have the type of vision that will push you in the right direction and that's basically what you want to do as a fashion photographer would you want to be on the lookout for is stuff that's not quite hit the popular magazines, even the the funkier ones, but rather it's on the street, for lack of a better way to say it. Because the world moves much faster now than it did when I was younger, if you see something, you can jump on it right away. Let's say, for instance, there's a award show, right? And some cool celebrities are going to it, and they're doing the red carpet and you're watching and you see a couple of cool trends there, or even one thing that you think, wow, that's really different. I've never seen that before. And boy, it really looked good on Beyonce or whatever. 
to quickly call your fashion stylist friend and be like, let's do something like Beyonce did with her hair. Yeah, that's where you want to be because if you can get it shot quick and get it up onto your social media so that you got it online within a day or so, now you're not really too late and it'll at least get you some traction. In the long run, if you really want to be a fashion photographer, it's got to be deeper than that. But I think that's another technique that you could try. Again, there's not just one way to do anything, right? Insofar as techniques, I think a fashion photographer out of all the other types of photography, for the most part, needs to be the most versatile. I talk a lot about being a specialist versus a generalist. But the reality is, is that as a fashion photographer, because fashion is trendy, different types of techniques, different types of equipment, different types of setups are going to come in and out of style, for lack of a better word, much quicker, right? Rembrandt lighting in a portrait is always going to be popular. It was popular before. It's popular now. Like I was saying earlier, I could teach somebody to do all the things you'd need to do for a headshot in one afternoon. You would get it all, you know, assuming you have a basic, uh, assuming you have a notebook to write it down and, you know, basic grasp of lighting. I could teach it all to you in one day. In fact, maybe that should be a workshop. But anyways, uh, but fashion, I could not because everything about fashion is in the moment and using a single light bulb hanging from a, a string might be the cool way to light right now. The next week it might be 15 movie lights. Then you might light with strobes. Then you might light with firecrackers. I mean, who knows what people are lighting with, right? Fashion is about experimentation. Fashion is about feeling. Fashion is about now. So make, give yourself a well-rounded technical background. Learn different types of lighting. Learn basic portraiture. Learn some product photography. That might come in handy. If you see some funky modifier for your light, try it. See if you can get something different, something that's going to, and again, not different for different sake, but different and works with the trend that's going on. I mean, just through the time that I've been shooting fashion, we've gone from heavily, heavily styled, you know, strobes outside, really saturated colors to black and white to looks like a snapshot. I mean, all these things have come and gone, ring lights, the movie lights, really elaborate sets, really basic sets. All these things have come and gone in fashion in the 20 or so years that I've worked in the industry. So they will continue to wrap around what is old is new, what's new is new, you know? So I definitely would just try to be well-versed in different types of lighting and technique if I was a fashion photographer. Mix it up, basically. Now, insofar as being any other type of photographer, I think what you need to look for when you're seeking inspiration is kind of the same. You want to see what's popular. Like I say, a Rembrandt lighting for a portrait is never going to go out of style. Butterfly lighting for beauty shots. These things are always going to be popular. So see what's going on there and see if you can add your own twist to it. That's basically it. I think for other types of photography, there are very specific toolkits that people use. So I think that's a little easier as far as technical goes. Rating and reviewing a small podcast like this one is the best way to get it in front of people. Well, short of having your friends go listen. So share this with your friends. But in any case, if you haven't rated the podcast, please do five stars and leave a review. And if you leave a review, I read one a week when I can. So I'm going to read one now. Great podcast from Top Jimmy 1968. I love this podcast, not your normal photography podcast. This one gets you to think deeper about the core of what photographers do, which is create. It is truly fantastic. Well, thanks, Top Jimmy. That's kind of the, my point. And I think that if I'm doing that and you're getting that, then I must be successful because what I want you to see here is that photography is not about learning where to place the softbox, but learning why we place the softbox and why we even want to make that photo to begin with. So like I said, guys, share the podcast around. We've been growing steadily, but man, I'd like to pop off and you know beat Joe Rogan. We'll, get, we'll knock out Joe Rogan soon, right? Maybe not, but hey, you know what? <laughs> If we can get in front of a lot of people and inspire them to shoot, that's all I'm really looking for. So as I was sitting down to record this, I saw here that uh, Richard uh, Glover uh, tweeted at me. He tweeted at me. <laughs> and if you don't follow me on Twitter, it's Daniel P. Norton. I'll put a link in the, the show notes. And he's actually uh, sharing a tweet from a person called Michael uh, Waterburn. Uh, in 2006, a high school English teacher asked students to write to a famous author and ask for advice. Kurt Vonnegut was the only one to respond. And right here, there is attached to this tweet, his response. So there's a little letter. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it wasn't written to me. No, but I won't read the whole thing because I would rather put the tweet 
in the show notes. You guys, I think I can do that. And you guys can go to the tweet and read it. And it's pretty cool. So if you want to tweet at me, if you have ideas of stuff for the show, let's talk, right? I'm a here. Like I said before, this is my platform. I try to get people to, to call in and send me emails to the show. But if you see me on Twitter and you got something to say, I'm more than happy to chat. Adorama supports this podcast and you can support them by going to adorama.com and buying any of your gear that you might need. Cameras, audio equipment, computers, all that stuff's available there. And if you go to adorama.com slash create no matter what, there's always great contests going on. So check that out. Well, that's the show for today. Thanks, Matthew, for writing in and Richard for tweeting at me. Thanks, Jimmy, for the review. Thank you for listening. If you want to be on the show, either with your voice or just your words, go ahead and reach out to me, a voice at dnphoto.com, or you can use the Anchor app to send me a message. Either way, I'll talk to you soon.